Okay, cool. Uh, chapter 34, The Economics of War. Right on. Uh, section 1, Total War. What can be best safeguard durable peace? What can best uh, safeguard durable peace, according to the old British liberals and their continental friends? The Manchester liberals. The Manchester liberals. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I hope that your culture was inspired by them in Manchester. Possibly. It's not very peaceful there. <laughs> mm. I think laissez-faire. Trade, mm. um, no barrier to movement of people and capital was the number one thing. Yeah. I, I agree. What has transformed the limited war between royal armies into total war, according to Mises? It was an attempt to make the last war, if I understand right. It was that um, it was always rulers fighting other rulers in other in other places, yeah. and then with the French Revolution, there was this change where it was supposedly the people against the rulers, and they wanted to they wanted to change it so that there would be no more war because they thought that the rulers were always the ones making the war. Mm -hmm. um, but apparently instead they just created this monolithic state. Uh, I think it was more accidental than that. That um, really the difference was that capitalism made people so wealthy. They were able to commit wars um, far greater than before and it's because of their um, specialization that the bakers were going to war with the tailors and in the case of Germany, Germany were the tailors. They couldn't do anything on their own as nations could have before. And now um, the people actually perceive a benefit to going to war. Like if the Germans are successful, then we will gain. Whereas before it was not the case under kingdoms that the people would gain when new territories were ceded. Are you saying that before like all of Germany would be specialized with respect to like all of France more or less? But then there became like sub specialization within a nation, and that allowed them to like to. It previously was the case that a nation could provide for all its wants, but poorly, and then it became the case that nations um, provided for only some wants and traded with others. So going to war, um, they would expect to benefit personally. The 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 Germans expected to benefit from a successful war, whereas previously under kingdoms they would not expect to benefit. It was only the kings. Okay. So what is the essential condition for peaceful coexistence? Laissez-faire. Yeah, I think that was the point of the section. Yeah. Well, and also underlying that is proliferation of philosophy i think he mentioned that only people adopting philo like philosophy of not wanting war is, yeah. is is ultimately going to make it happen right right he did say that like yeah it doesn't seem like industry per se is enough mm -hmm. yeah i agree uh section two war in the market economy and this is a comment it surrendered to the claim of the unions and the workers real take-home wages should be kept at, at a height which would enable them to preserve in the war their pre-war standard of living. And the question is, why did the shortcomings of the methods adopted for financing war expenditures make government control necessary? I can read that again. Why did the shortcomings of the methods adopted for financing war expenditures make government control necessary? One of the pa patterns pointed out was that in a market economy, when it's not a war, they, like they thought that market economies only work during peacetime. Mm -hmm. um, and I still hear, heard the, hear this argued all the time, 
And I think the problem is that the state took over the market and had wars. And then like when they let the market be, they weren't preparing for war. And then more wars came and they were like, oh, well, we need, we need perpetual preparation for war. Mm-hmm. I guess that's not really financing. Yeah. I'm not really sure what this... So the shortcomings for adopting... Why did the shortcomings of the methods adopted for financing war expenditures make government control necessary? So that's really asking, um, because the, I mean, is this a trick question in a way? I think this is in the perspective, from the perspective of the war state. Yeah. Like they think that it's necessary. The problem is that. Oh, so they're like saying, look, the market isn't financing this war. So we need to take control ourselves. Yes, but yeah, and the problem with war is that it's pure consumption, and what it does is it it eliminates mm -hmm. savings. Yeah. So, and because the state isn't when they're making war, they're not thinking about replacing the capital. Mm -hmm. They aren't saving; they're spending savings. Right. And so, that is not a way to finance future war. Right. So they have to then confiscate more. Hmm. So war is really expensive because not only are you not producing, you're just really consuming purely. Okay. The transition from peace to war changes the structure of the market and makes readjustments indispensable. How does the readjustments of the market constitute a source of profit? So we're talking about from going to peace war, uh, peace to war, and it changes the market structure. I'd say, I don't know, it, it might create profit opportunities for like weapons manufacturers or like steel plants, but doesn't necessarily make the total profit go higher. Because whenever the, like the market restructures, yeah, some people are gonna make um, profit with the new structure, but overall, there's less production. Are you saying the transition from peace to war? Yeah, like some people benefit from going to war, like some people profit. Well, it, it also increases aggregate spending in the short run. Mm -hmm. Because it takes from savings, which are supposed to be spent in sometime in the future. Yeah. And spends them now. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, section three. War and autarky. Did I say that word? Yeah. What is it meant by the doctrine of erzatz? What are the two theorems of this doctrine? Why are both theorems fallacious? <clears throat> I think it's about a German word for substitutions that are used in wartime especially. So things that are of lower quality um, or more expensive or both. And the fallacy is that you shouldn't use, you shouldn't use substitutions. The, um, well, the truth is that you shouldn't use the substitutions because they are not as good and will be a disservice to your fighters. You should give your soldiers uh, and your army the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Synthetic rubber that was used and synthetic gasoline in Germany um, was not advantageous. Yeah, I think that's spot on. Ersatz? Ersatz, yeah. That's the, the weak substitutes. Uh, section four, the futility of war. And this is a comment. 
Economic nationalism, the necessary complement of domestic interventionism, hurts the interests of foreign peoples and thus creates international conflict. Why isn't the construction of new and dreadful weapons the root of evil? What is the real source of war? You can read it again, too. Why isn't the construction of new and dreadful weapons the root of evil? What is the real source of war? Yeah, it's a rejection of laissez-faire. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the bombs are going to get. They're always going to get better. Uh, the defenses will get better to defend against the new bombs. That'll continue ad infinitum until people realize that they're better off not hurting each other, which is just an extension of um, the non-aggression principle, and then that follows to laissez-faire attitudes toward businesses. On an individual level, too, a rejection of laissez-faire, I think, really stems just from people wanting to isolate their income from the market. Like, it's a lot easier if you don't have to continually compete in the market to get income, if you can figure out a way to take from others. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm, I think every every single person has this is like innate desire to earn resources without doing anything right <laughs> of course <laughs> so, like, i think that is actually the fundamental cause of war mm. the emergence of the international division of labor requires the total abolition of war such is the essence of the laissez-faire philosophy of manchester Okay, um, that was chapter 34. All right. Which Did he like, talk about any of the particular philosophers from the School of Manchester? I don't recall. I don't remember. I'd love to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, was Manchester the first kind of state to implement laissez-faire, or were they just the most uh, prosperous? Why do they use that example? I think Manchester was probably centered around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Probably where the first railroads to coal mines started happening. So would be my guess. Okay. Have you read any other chapters? Yeah, I was going to... You want to do the next one? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the chapter 35... The welfare principle versus the market principle. Uh, section one, the case against the market economy. There's no questions, there's just a comment. Okay. A principle that is broad enough to cover all doctrines, however conflicting with one another, is of no use at all. <laughs> Interesting. What is that? What does that mean in the context of welfare versus? So the section header is the case against the market economy, and uh, the comment was a principle that is broad enough to cover all doctrines, however conflicting with one another, is of no use at all. I don't remember the specific argument they used against the market economy? It sounds like they're saying that at a fundamental level, the art, like the structure of the market economy is like um, irreconcilable with itself, that it has contradictions, mm -hmm. like you can't create, because the market claims to include everyone and in all ideologies. And they're probably saying that that's impossible well, I think it's the opposite. It's about welfare being too inclusive. The word welfare presupposes goodness um, in all respects. So if you're against welfare, then um, you're against goodness. But the 
market can provide the goodness for the people um, without a system of redistribution, also known as welfare. So it's just a, it's a terminology that's too broad. Yeah, I think they talked mm. about like propagandist terms. Um, it's like you can you can call it what you want, but um, that kind of the point that they named it welfare is kind of like a signal that it's probably not the best thing because they're trying to like insert these thoughts into your head that it's good. Mm, right, because it's like neurolinguistic programming. Yeah. Yeah, here's a quote. However, if we interpret welfare in this manner, the concept becomes meaningless. It can be invoked for the justification of a variety of social organization. Okay. Section in, in what manner? Oh. Um, it said in this manner. Um, the preceding paragraph says... quite long so I, I ah. just skipped it as a reference I'll, I'll go on to the next section uh, two war in the market economy what system is Mises describing with this quote the inherent weakness of such a society is that the increase in population must result in progressive poverty. Would you read that again, please? Yeah. What system is Mises describing with this quote? The inherent weakness of such a society is that the increase in population must result in progressive poverty. It has to be the welfare yeah. society because in order to support welfare, you're always taking from savings that were meant for the future. Mm -hmm. And so if, if people have saved for the future, the population is correct right now. And if we yeah. in increase that by taking from the future, now there's more people in the future, but less resources than we expect, which is then in order to keep up the standard you have to take more from the future yeah i think the example they used was uh, a landowner who has a, a plot of land to provide for himself and then the child each like subsequent generation if like nothing more is produced is just getting a smaller and smaller piece of land until like you you don't have you have a tiny little porcel of land that you can't provide for yourself mm. but that's like assuming nothing's being produced well i know families uh, to whom that exact thing happened really but like four or five generations ago they had big ranches in texas yeah and as the people well first of all the the children were living off like their parents wealth but also taking incentives to not work Mm -hmm. And now they only have, like, the tiniest bit of that land left. Wow. What disti distinguishes the West from Asia with regard to the capital invested per person? What are the consequences of the lack of capital invested? Hmm. It's a higher standard of living in the West because of industrialization. Yeah, I remember reading... Um, I can't, he, he definitely discussed uh, the, the Asian kind of philosophy. In this chapter? Yeah. Um, I forget what it said, though. I assume that the Asian cultures invested less in long-term capital. Yeah. Does he explain what about them? Um, the part I really remember st sticking out is him predicting that these will fall into authoritarian states. And it's like, wow, you kind of were spot on. Um, here, this is section two. 
He says that they like the gadgets and gizmos that come from, and the paraphernalia that come from capital accumulation. Even though they don't really know how to make it themselves. Yeah. Why is it false to blame the European powers for the part poverty of the masses in colonial countries? Why would they be yeah, um, blamed for the poverty of the masses? Well, they have so much more wealth, so they must be exploiting them in some way. I don't know. I can't really think of a reason why they would be blamed. Some people think that there's a pie, limited pie of wealth, that some people being wealthy de facto means that others are poor. And so people who believe like that might think that someone who's wealthy somewhere is uh, responsible for other people who are poor elsewhere. Is it just a lack of capital invested? Like, I think that so, or charity. And um, f freedom of um, business. Some pe people mm. aren't free to do business and they're poor for that reason. Mm. Well, th yeah. yeah, this question is talking about blaming European powers for the poverty of the masses. Oh, so you'd say the European powers are not allowing investment uh, i didn't say that oh but it could be the case that yeah. wherever the places are are not free to do business yeah it could be the opposite that the europeans came in and they like business but the, yeah. the native culture is not really ready for um that level of freedom yeah yeah and if you just believe that everyone should have the same like everyone should have the same like uh, wealth equality, then you could just blame the rich Europeans for not giving their wealth to the colonials, if that's what you believe. I think the Europeans would be very glad to give colonials capital equipment mm -hmm. because labor's cheaper if right. they knew how to maintain it and grow it. Mm -hmm. Here's a comment. Within the frame of capitalism, the notion of poverty refers only to those people who are unable to take care of themselves. So, yeah, I think you kind of said that, what you just said. Um, under capitalism, who cares for those who are handicapped by bodily incapacity? I'd say charity. Right. And, I mean falling prices of everything like mm -hmm. I think yeah. ultimately capitalism takes care of, of those people right no, but it, at the same time it also causes their capitalism makes it possible to sustain a lot more poor people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess it it may not decrease poverty but it, it might actually increase the amount of people in poverty yeah is wouldn't so going back to you thinking that everyone has some people have like just an innate um desire to like get something for really not doing anything so you know under a really capitalistic society like you can get a lot for not really doing much so i think there'd be a lot more poor people well poor as being on the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah, we were we were in Manchester the other day, and there were people like living on the street, and I was amazed. Like, how are these people even alive? <laughs> but like, they they probably never exchange money or anything. But there's so much wealth around that yeah. they they can just be around. What are the two main alleged def? Defects of charity. What are the two main alleged defects of charity? Ch 
Charity is criticized for its inadequ- inadequacy. Mm. And charity is also criticized for its demeaning effects on the recipient. Mm. Yeah, people want to be independent. They they don't want to depend on others. How I don't understand how that's a valid criticism because what's the alternative is welfare. Mm-hmm. And it, it, isn't that more demeaning than receiving charity? Well, not without the existence of capitalism. No, capitalism see- makes it such that it's pathetic to receive charity because one can provide for oneself and we see that that's possible well i mean even the what about the people who who just there are some people that are always just going to be unable to take like yeah yeah but you have no arms and legs pathetic well that's that's different from like i would say the, the majority of people yeah but also like you feel pathetic because you could like there's a lot of people who could not use charity in a mm-hmm. capitalist world but they do and it makes them feel pathetic hmm. right and before capitalism it really was just the, the state of things that you know people who weren't able to provide for themselves were the recipients of charity of course or they died and we didn't even see them mm-hmm. so it's only because of a wealthy civilized society that we have so many poor and disabled people Mm -hmm. they otherwise would never have existed and derek you always bring up that charity is conditional a lot of the time especially coming from the church so whereas welfare all you have to do is have a heartbeat yeah and you can you know a, a number and you can get the welfare. Well, with the church charity, if you, I mean, if you're bad, the, you, they're going to stop taking care of you. you mm-hmm. know, if you're totally pathetic, they'll probably take care of you. But if you're like, like not doing what you're supposed to, or if you're like a drunk or something, then you're dead. You're gone. Mm-hmm. Like Welfare, I think, was changed recently in the U.S. Um, to a welfare to work in some places. And what, people just came off of welfare. because you have to work to get it Mm -hmm. (laughs) which incentivizes what which incentives are eliminated by the social security system saving Uh, yeah saving so it, it had plural incentives so savings and what else Can you repeat the question? Well, and specifically investing in in um, care for elderly, like it, because it it removes, um, whereas elderly people without social security would be saving and then paying for things when they're mm-hmm. older. Then there's like entrepreneurs come in and and create the products to take care of the elderly. Well, if they're not saving to pay for those products, then no entrepreneurs are going to come and and provide those products. Yeah. So I guess the question again for you is which incentives are eliminated by social security system? So the pro- the profit incentive is reduced. Yeah. It in and it just distorts the market for, you know, the people that are getting social security. Maybe there's different products being offered because everyone's on the same fixed income. Uh, three inequality why would the elimination of inequality of incomes and wealth destroy the market economy it it ruins the profit incentives if there's no inequality in wealth then that means there's no one making any profit so there's no reason to participate in the market yeah man Pocahontas proposed a, a wealth tax, just five percent of all the wealth <laughs> that you have. If you if you make more than ten million dollars or something, yeah, or if you have, and 
she was like, well, this will just fund everything forever. <laughs> and it's like, people are just going to stop producing anything if you, t- if you take their stuff. Yeah. Why would they? Why has the principle of equality under the law been chosen by the liberals? Why has the principle of equality under the law been chosen by the liberals? Is he speaking like a Manchester liberal kind of person? I assume so. Leslie Fair liberal? I think that's, yeah, I think that's generally the liberal he's talking about in this whole book. I mean, without it, there's so much unpredictability. Like, if, if, if like some people are treated differently than others, then how do you invest? Yeah. Like, how do you have stability? How, how do you know that you can create a business and your competitor can't just use arbitrary force to take it down because mm-hmm. they don't be, because something about you? I don't remember the part in the in the chapter though. The yeah. liberal philosophy attacked the traditional caste system because its preservation was incompatible with the operation of the market economy. Mm. What is wrong with the argument that the public debt is no burden because we owe it ourselves? <laughs> the this one is really good. Um, it's because you owe it to someone in the past. Yeah. There's a there's a really good. It's like a 40 50 minute video, but like and I think it's from the guy who wrote this book. Um, about Robert Murphy or Mises? Robert Murphy. Yeah, the the study guide. Um, and yeah, he like completely debunks this whole. Um, this whole thing because it's all about time preference and like who you're actually like where you're actually taking the consumption from in time and of course like who who would really be investing in the pro in the, the product that they get from the welfare state in 40 years like yeah no rational person they would invest in like completely other Right. lines of production like but you can't so like it it, it removes your your ability to accumulate capital mm-hmm. spending and unbalanced budgets are merely synonyms for capital consumption uh section four insecurity and comment a characteristic feature of the unhampered market is that there is no recipient receptor of invest of vested interest respecter i'm sorry i'm just going to read the question what is the explanation of the events of 1929 according to mises why is this date important with regard to the question of security was that two separate things the part about vested interests yeah that was a comment so the question is what is the explanation of the events of 1929, according to Mises? Why is this date important with regard to the question of security? So, 1929 is um, when the markets crashed, I believe, right? Right, the end to the spectacular bull market of yeah. the 1920s. If I may read... Uh section from the book the longing for security became especially intense in the great depression that started in 1929 it met with an enthusiastic response from the millions of unemployed that is capitalism for you shouted the leaders of the pressure groups of the farmers and the wage earners yet the evils were not created by capitalism but on the contrary by the endeavors to reform and to improve the operation of the market economy by interventionism. 
The crash was the necessary outcome of the attempts to lower the rate of interest by credit expansion. Institutional unemployment was the inevitable result of the policy of minimum wage rates. Mm. Oh, man. Deja vu. Seems like we're living in 1928-27, and you're hearing bumblings of all that again. But we could also be living in, like, 1921, which Mm -hmm. is when there was a flash crash in 1921. Um, Mm -hmm. And instead of, like, I guess they did liquidate instead of trying to prop it up and it was all fine. Um, but it was actually a bigger crash than 1929. Mm -hmm. But then after that, they started pumping money and lowering rates and pumping money into the market. Yeah. seems like rates are already negative. It's like, how can they pump them that much anymore? Like when there is a crash, I don't know. They uh, just will. <laughs> they'll find a way. Maybe, maybe they'll let it clear out. There's a really good book called America's Great Depression mm-hmm. by Murray Rothbard, and it's a rather quantitative analysis of those two decades, twenties and thirties, and it's really meaty and and good and interesting. What is it called again? America's Great Depression. Okay, Uh, the last section, Uh, social justice. Comment, their last word is always state, government, society, or other cleverly designed synonym for the superhuman dictator. Why doesn't the market economy need apologists and propagandists? Because the market economy is producing at its highest capacity. I think also because it, the market is full of propagandists, yeah. but it, everyone, it's called advertising. Like everyone has this incentive to put out their own propaganda and, and it's such that everyone's selfish interests are served by cooperating. And so that like everyone can just be selfish. They don't need someone to be selfish for them. They don't need someone in the middle saying like this, you know, this is how it ought to be. Everyone can just say how they want it to be. And then, and then it, it turns out that way. Mm-hmm. It seems like there still could be a need for propagandists, maybe not for the state, but for your business. Like, I think you could benefit using propaganda to make people want to buy your product definitely and but you also benefit by everyone else using propaganda to try to get their product sold at your expense like Mm -hmm. like it just so happens that by competing we all benefit so the question was why don't we need a a central a single like propaganda machine yeah yeah in, in a line, uh, Mises says, there is no need to tell us that an ampler supply of various commodities would be welcome to all people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So the, that, to shorten that, basically the market's better, and that's why you don't need propaganda. <laughs> Yeah. All right, that was uh, chapter 35. Wonderful. Well, it's, there's not much left now. Yeah, it, I think there's there's four chapters left. Okay. Shall we aim to complete all of them in the next um, sit-down session? Yeah, I could, could, like, maybe Sunday, if you're around. Okay. We can... Then we have we'll have like two hours if we need it. That sounds good. It'll be done. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. Bob Murphy wrote a. Go ahead. He wrote a man economy and state study guide, right? I don't know. 
But if so, I would read that. Yeah, yeah, but it's gonna be, it will be much easier if we have one. A study guide. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, this is like key, I think. Yeah. Kind of keeps us on track. Mm-hmm.